Welcome to Crimepedia Podcast. I am your host this week. I am Cherry. And with me, as always, is my BFF. It is Morgan. Hello, Cherry. How are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you doing? Quite well, thank you. And we are in, well and truly, in the Christmas season now. It's coming up to Christmas. We've got one episode left before Christmas. That's our last one of 2020, 2023. That's crazy. Yeah. That's actually like quite just, frightening. The year just started. <laughs> I know. It's come around really, really quickly. So, yeah, we've got one more episode left next week. That'll be Morgan's episode. Um, and then we'll be taking a break for Christmas to leave you guys to get on with family stuffs. And um, we'll be back in the new year. Then I think we're back. Yeah, we're back early in the new year. So that'll be quite nice. Yeah, I think it's the, was it the second week in January, I think it is. Yeah, uh, I think it is. So yeah. Ninth, like right around ninth January ninth, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, I think that's our. Yeah, it's exciting. So we've got a lot of lot of cases to um to talk about for next year. We've had a lot of suggestions, which I'm really pleased. Um, thank you so much for all of your case suggestions. And um, we definitely do look into them. You should always, if you do suggest a case to us, you will normally get a reply back from us. So we will reply to you, and then we'll put your case on the list to look into. Um, we have got quite a few, which has been really lovely. So um, we've had a lot of people that have come forward with with case suggestions. And if you want to do that, you can indeed do that. All you need to do is just email us. Easy cherry at Christ crimepediapodcast.com or morgan at crimepediapodcast.com or you can catch us on our socials but i would say we're not that often on facebook i have to keep saying that because i keep finding messages from people on there from weeks ago and i haven't seen them so i'm not being rude at all um it's just us we don't have a team that manage our our um our social media so it's just us doing twitter and facebook and everything else and or x as it's now known um and our instagram and stuff like that so we tend to be most easily reached on instagram if you did want to message us so just just so that you know now this week's case is a case it's a a more recent case for me anyway you know how i like the old style cases this is a case Mm -hmm. that um is from 1966 so it's quite recent wow i know it is very recent for me um and this was one that i came across when i was researching um london i was for another project i was researching crimes in London and this one came up and I must say I've, I had never heard of this and when I was reading through it there were so many different there's so many different links to this so many different people that it could have been that were, could have been the perpetrator that I really wanted to talk about this particularly because it was such a long time ago and the family of this uh, of the of the victim the parents have now both since passed away um and i always think that those cases are particularly sad when a parent passes on after the death and they don't get the resolution or they don't get the answers that they're looking for and so i think it's really important to keep cases like this alive because the more we talk about them the more the more alive they are if usually if no one's talking about them they're kind of shelved unless something new comes to light and so in that case this week's case is the murder of Patsy Morris Teenage girls are full of mystery, hormones all over the place as they embark on the journey to adulthood. For one young woman, adulthood would never be a place that she would reach. Her parents would never know what kind of adult life she would lead, what job she'd have, and if she'd even have a family of her own one day. Someone took that away from them. This is Crimepedia, and this is the case of Patsy Morris. Okay, Morgan, so Patsy was born Patricia Morris on the 10th of January 1966. She lived with her father, George, who I've read different reports. Some of the reports say he was retired, a retired chief from the army. Um, Other reports say he's retired and works, still works in the barracks. So I think... I'm going to go with what the police report said, um, because, again, I think that's most most accurate. And we'll go with the fact that he was retired, uh, retired from his post in the army, but he still worked within the barracks. Her mum, Marjorie, 
and her sister and two brothers all lived together. She had moved with her family from Birmingham to Isleworth in southwest London. Now, she moved to a place called Signet Avenue. And they moved in 1979. And she attended Feltham Comprehensive School with all her siblings all went to the same school. Now, on the 16th of June, 1980, she was 14 years old. She was blonde. She was bubbly. She had lots of friends. Um, she wasn't, as far as we know from the reports that we've got from friends and things, she was quite an outgoing girl, but not over the top outgoing. So people knew of her, but it wasn't like she was like the life and soul of school, if you know what I mean. Now, on that day, Patsy left her school during lunch break. She told her friends that she'd forgotten her raincoat that morning and she was completely soaked through. She had decided to go home at lunch, get her coat, get changed mm-hmm. into dry clothes, and then she would go back to school for the second half of the day. So a witness recalls seeing Patsy soon after noon that day near her home, and I believe that this was a neighbour. There was another witness who recalled seeing a girl who may have been Patsy crouching at a bus stop on the Hounslow Heath side of Staines Road. Now, this is just west of the Hussar Public House. And they say that they saw her there between 12.20 and 12.40 p.m. So this would be like the lunch break. Some schools will break up for lunch between sort of half past 12 and half past one. Um, And both of these witnesses recall seeing her around noon-ish, between sort of noon and one o'clock. So we've got like an hour window of where two people think they might have seen her, okay? And this was the last sightings that we have of Patsy. Now, Patsy had double history that afternoon and there have been suggestions from friends of hers that she hated that class and would regularly bunk off. So she would regularly skip that class and go somewhere else. And there was suggestions that perhaps that day the the wet coat and that kind of thing was just like a ruse to be an excuse for her to leave school. And I can understand that. You know, when you go to school and you're a teenager and you get a double yeah. a double class in the afternoon that you absolutely hate – you can kind of use that excuse that, oh, I'm soaking wet through, I need to go home and change and something happened and I couldn't get back to school. Yeah, right, right, right. So the two sightings of Patsy near her home and crouching by the bus stop are the last sightings that anyone had seen because she failed to return home from school that day. Now, her siblings, obviously all in the same school, she didn't meet them to walk home. They didn't know where she were, um, where she was, sorry. And her parents then began to get worried. So they called the police and reported her missing. Now, after she was reported missing, police launched actually quite a large operation to find her. This involved hundreds of police officers. They took this quite seriously right from the beginning. They had helicopters out to look for her. They had members of the public who volunteered to help look for her because she was at the time only 14. This is in 1980. So she was, you know, she's a young girl. She's missing from her home. It's not her usual thing. She wasn't the sort of kid that would like truant and not come home. She was quite a dependable girl. She did what she was told. Her parents have said she was, you know, she wasn't one of those kids that broke the rules that they knew of. But... Mm -hmm. Who really knows what their 14-year-old kids are up to, realistically? Right. You know? Right. You are, when you're a teenager, you are one thing in front of parents and completely different with your friends, aren't you? We all know that. We've done it. We've, you know, we've been there. At that, at that age, you are, you're testing the waters a little bit, right? To see what can I get away with? What, what can't I get away with? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. My parents will never know. Yeah, exactly. There's some water testing. They're seeing, they're just, they're putting their toe in to see how much independence they really, really have. Yeah. And and it's a weird age, isn't it, 14? Because it's that age where you're not, mm-hmm. you're not an adult. You're not quite uh, like an older teen. You just come out of like preteen. So you're kind of like, you just, you're just learning. You're learning the way of the world, aren't you? And it, it's difficult mm-hmm. because 14 year olds don't always make the best decisions. Exactly. Yeah, especially here, it's a weird time because usually like 13, 14, um, with how our school system set up, that's usually like you're, when you're 13, 14, you're in eighth grade. So middle right. school, right? Yeah. Eighth grade is the last, the last year of middle school. So you're at the top of the food chain. Right. You know, the okay. hierarchy. Yeah. And then you quickly move on to high school where you're right back to the bottom. So yeah, so so for a very short period of time there, being a 14 year old, you feel like you, yeah. you're top of the tree. You feel like, you know, 
here I am. I finally made it. Yeah. And you're about to hit the ceiling. And I know everything. Right I'm grown down. up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So here in England, um, 14 year olds are in sort of year eight, year nine. That's 11. Yeah. Okay. So about year eight, year nine. Now, uh, as as the parent of a teenage girl, <laughs> year nine, I must say, is the most testing year as a parent of a teenage girl. It's the year yeah. where they're not quite, because obviously we start our secondary school in year seven. So you finish, you'd finish primary school, you start secondary school in year, year seven, which is about 11 years old. So when you get into year nine, mm-hmm. you've been in school a couple of years, you kind of know everybody, you know everything, you're not quite top of the tree, but you're not that new kid anymore. You're not you're not the like the green right. kids, the first year kids. You've had a couple of years to settle in. So I found, and a lot of my friends with teenagers um, at the time found that year nine was the back chatting year, the the testing of the smoking year, the mm. staying out late yeah. and not coming back when you're supposed to year. It was the worst year of the whole of of the secondary school. I I think personally. Yeah, so she's no. well yeah, and yeah. truly she's well and truly in that in that um in that years now two days later on the evening of the 18th of june a police dog handler was searching the edge of hounslow heath now you might hounslow heath is in london and there are a lot of crimes that have happened on hounslow heath um later on we'll talk about a potential um suspect in this that you will recognize the name of and it's not the sort of place that you really want to be walking by yourself. Now, he was on the edge of Hounslow Heath and unfortunately he made a grim discovery. He discovered the body of a young woman who was face down in a copse by a pathway. Now, the location of her body was a quarter of a mile from where she lived, from where Patsy lived. It was a five minute walk from where she lived and Mm. it was on the route between her home and her father's workplace, which is at Calvary Barracks, which is next to like a golf course. Now, there are conflicting reports on how Patsy was found. And this is very, if you look this up on the internet, if you have a look around the different articles and the different reports and the police reports that I've read, um, I've read that she's been found half naked. Then I've read that she was found fully clothed. I'd read that she had been raped. And then I read that police had found no sign of sexual assault. So it's very hard to determine true facts in what happens when there's so many conflicting accounts of what uh, of what was found. So again, I'm going to go with the initial police reports that I read because I think that that's going to be the the most chance of being correct because a lot of the articles and things are obviously people's interpretations of what happened. So I'm going with the initial police reports and the official um, reports and, and the official requests that were put out by police at the time, the appeals. So the police reports say that Patsy had been strangled with a ligature believed to have been her tights. It was also reported, mm. and this is very widely reported, um, that she was wearing two pairs of underwear Now, this was initially quite a puzzle for the police, but as a female, this isn't something that I find puzzling at all. And especially being a teenager at school, this was commonplace when I was a teenager. So at that age, you're 14, you're new to like body changes, you're new to periods and that kind of thing. And having to do lessons like PE can be very embarrassing at that age because you haven't quite got to grips with the cycles of things going on in your life. Okay. So to save embarrassment, a lot of girls would wear two pairs of pants, like two pairs of underwear. Another yeah. reason girls might wear two pairs of underwear. And this is for, for me is what we used to do. If it was winter time or it was cold and you were wearing tights, your tights always fall down. No matter what size you get, they always fall down. So what we would do is you'd have your normal underwear on, then you'd have your tights on. And then you'd have what you call those pantyhose over there. Don't you tights? Yep. Pantyhose? Yeah. Okay. So then you'd have yep. those on. And then to keep them up, you'd put another pair of underwear over the top. So that would like make sure it didn't they didn't fall down, basically. So two pairs of underwear didn't really shock me or like make me think that was a, initially a puzzle. But apparently police were con- like confused as to why she would be wearing two pairs of underwear. <laughs> um, no, that that makes perfectly good sense to me. Yeah, and, and another reason, see, another reason why you might wear two pairs is because if you had PE. And you wouldn't like you're getting changed and you have to go and do PE in front of um, like boys. In our school, we had to wear PE skirts at the time. So we're talking about roughly the same sort of time when I was a kid. Um, we had to wear PE skirts. And so it was always embarrassing if you were playing something like netball. And if you jump up in the air or something, then everybody can see your underwear. So 
what we would do would be you would wear your normal underwear and then you'd have like PE underwear, which is be that would be dark to match your PE skirt. So then it you wouldn't yeah. really notice so much, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So that was like another reason. So that that's possibly why I personally think she could have been wearing two pairs of underwear. Now, they said that the post-mortem found no signs of sexual assault or actually other injuries other than this ligature strangulation around her neck. Now, police released a public statement after finding Patsy warning parents not to let their children around West London cross Hounslow Heath alone. Now, this is something that mm. I think parents would tell their children anyway, you know, don't cross the heath by yourself because it's even back then there was still, there were still reports of rapes. There were still reports of attacks um, on Hounslow Heath, yeah. even, even back then. So I think realistically, most parents living in the area would particularly teenage girls would tell them not to cross the heath by themselves. I mean, you think now, in your area that you live in, there's going to be areas that you're going to say to your teenage daughter, don't walk that way alone. It may be quicker, right. but don't walk that way on your own. You know? So I think it, I think it's only, only reasonable to think that. So, okay. I'm trying to figure this out. So she was last yeah. seen by this uh, Hussar public house pub. By the pub, yeah. By um, the pub, yeah. Which by is, one witness. By one witness, okay. Which is yeah. on the, I would say, the, the northern edge of this Hounslow Heath. That's right, yep. And then Signet would be all the way across Hounslow Heath to yes. the southwest. Now I'm assuming was this a? I'm, I'm assuming it was a public a public bus stop where she, where she yes. was seen. Yeah. So would she have been? Was she walking, or did she take the, or did she actually take the bus? Well, they didn't say. All they saw was that she was crouching down by the bus stop. That's. That's all they saw is a girl that matched okay. her description crouching down by the bus stop, by the heath. Mm. So whether she was there going to catch a bus or whether she was right. there and she missed the bus and then decided to walk across the heath. Because again, like we've said, 14-year-olds yeah. don't always make sensible decisions. They cut through alleys instead of walking the long way around because they think, oh, nothing's going to happen to me. It's just an alley. I'll just walk quickly through it. I've done it. You know, I've been 14. I've done that. I've walked through places I shouldn't have walked through. And my mum has told me, do not walk that yeah. way. And I think, well, I can run through that in like five minutes or I can walk all the way around, which is going to take me at least half an hour. What are you going to do? You yeah. cut through. I'm just, I'm curious because I, I would assume that if, let's say that she had taken a bus, that there would be yeah. closer bus stops to where her house is. I mean, because if you, if you like looking at, um, looking at where she is, like she would be closer to like the center part of Feltham than where yeah. she supposedly was last seen. Yeah. I'm not, yeah, I'm not so sure why. Like why so, it might not have even yes. been her, mightn't it? That's the thing. That's true. Yeah. So, so if it wasn't her, then it's not a big deal. If it was her, what is she doing there when? Yeah. Why that bus really stop? She, why that bus stop? Because obviously there's, there's going to be bus stops that are closer to her than yeah. where she was seen. So, well, the pa Patsy's parents did say that she had no reason to be on Hounslow Heath at all. And they said that they couldn't mm -hmm. understand what she was doing on the Heath. She was always told not to go there and she never disobeyed our orders. I get that. From a parent's point of view, you like to think that your kid is never going to do what you've asked them not to do. But, you know, we've all been teenagers and we've all gone, oh, what a mum and dad know. They'll never know. Yeah. Let's just, you know. So I can see that. Now, the thing that... Re that made me think about that was I thought normally if you're going to skip school, okay, you don't usually skip school on your own. If you're going to skip a class, you wouldn't, I don't think you would, you would, there'd be a reason for you going to that Heath. Okay. You wouldn't just yeah. go and walk on the Heath for no reason. Like I can understand cutting through it to get somewhere else because it was quicker, but there would be no reason for her to just go and, oh, I'll just go and walk across the Heath because I've got nothing to do. I don't think that, that would be the case, particularly as she probably had her house key and mum and dad were both at work. So she could have gone home and right. nobody would have known. Now, the neighbor mm -hmm. said she had returned home that lunchtime and had believed that maybe... 
Patsy had forgotten her key and was crossing the heath to go to her father's work to get the key so that she could go back mm. to the house and get changed. Now that makes sense. Okay. That's plausible enough. Instead of she's thinking, yep. oh God, I'm soaking wet. I'm freezing cold. I've got to go back to school or not, but I can't get into the house because I've forgotten my key. So I'll just cross over the heath rather than go all the way around. She could have gone to the bus stop and then, you know, to catch the bus to where her dad worked. Maybe that was the only bus that went from that stop. So she could have gone there, okay. stopped at that bus, but then the bus was too late. So she's thought, oh, do you know what? I'll just walk across the heath. It will only take me however long. So right. that sounds like a plausible enough um, reason for her to be on the heath but that's if she was going home to get changed if she was going home to bunk off of school i wonder if she was meeting somebody yeah and Um, if that person doesn't have great intentions the heath would be a good place to meet her you know because even if it was a teenage boy um if it's going to be somebody who's a little bit edgy or a little bit out there, somebody who she's not supposed to be seeing or, you know, she's not supposed to be being seen with, probably the Heath would be a good place to go because people aren't going to be just randomly walking across the Heath. So there's less chance that she's going to get caught meeting that person because they're out the way, you know? Yeah. And I only think this because of my own experiences. When I was a teenager, to walk to school, I had to walk across a massive heath to get to school. And Mm -hmm. if I walked the long way around, it would take me almost an hour to get to school. But if I cut across the heath, that which my mum would say, you only do it with your brother or if you're walking with somebody else, it would take me 15 minutes. And I will admit the amount of times I've walked across that heath on my own because it would only take 15 minutes and I didn't want to walk the full 45 minutes all the way around. And I did it loads of times. And I've also met people I shouldn't have been meeting on the Heath, you know? (gasps) Cherry. I know. (laughs) Bad teenage me. But but that's what makes me think I wonder if she was meeting somebody, you know? Because that would also make sense. Okay, so just thinking about this. Yeah. Let's say that, okay, let's say that, yeah, either one let's say that either she's meeting someone and she's going across the heath or she's walking to the barracks because yeah. she have a key yeah let's say the siding of her across the street from from the hussar is yeah. valid which for some reason i kind of feel like it would be because it, you think about this how many how many 14 year old girls are you going to be seeing in that area at this time when school's in session right yeah, that's true. You're not going to be seeing a whole whole lot, right? So if someone, no. I I just have this feeling, that, okay, if someone saw saw a 14 year old girl right there, chances are it, it probably was Patsy. That's that's what I'm kind of feeling feeling like. But here's okay. the thing. Let's say that, that that sighting is valid, and that would indicate that she's already crossed the heath once. So if she was going to go to her dad's you know, work to get to, to get a key. Yeah. That would mean that the dad would, would have seen her. Yeah. And then she would have, then something would have happened to her on the the way way back. Yeah. I get what you're saying. So we know for, we we know that dad didn't see her. He, she didn't go to retrieve a key. No, she didn't. So she made it to Heath. Then, then what happened? Did someone, you know, did someone get her on her way down, you know, walking down the street and take her back into the Heath? Yeah. Or, yeah. like you said, was she going to meet someone? Hmm. Well, the police questioned all of Patsy's friends and her classmates, and they mm-hmm. tried to find out what her movements had been. And to be honest, most of the kids didn't, all other than saying, well, she didn't really like history, so she would usually bunk off of history, and she, you know, she wouldn't be in school for that. There wasn't really anything that anybody, um, you know, dobbed her in about. There, there was no kind of like friends that talked about a secret boyfriend or the fact that she talked about a boyfriend or anything like that. So, the mm-hmm. talking to the friends kind of drew a blank. Really, they they didn't really have much to offer. Now, on the twenty second of June, which was two day, a uh, four day, sorry, after she was found dead, a detective on the investigative team told the press that they felt that another youngster playing truant could hold key information on the murder. 
Now, there's not a lot of information on this youngster that they're talking about, other than the fact that they are saying that they believe that one of her friends may have a lot more to say than they actually are. Um, In December of 1980, the police had some information come forward and they publicly appealed for a driver of a blue van with a telephone in it to come forward. Now, Back in the 80s, the only like vehicle telephone that you could get was kind of like a big box telephone. Um, and it was, it, I mean, in England, if you've ever seen Del Boy and his um, his his telephone, it's this huge box, a massive antenna on it. Um, and, it and it's like, in, is it Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Doesn't he have one in there in the car? He's got this huge like car phone. Oh. Yeah, no, Tommy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a satellite phone. So there's not very many of these. We know that there wasn't a lot of cars or vans that had a phone, a satellite phone in it. Now, they appealed for this driver because the guy was seen using the telephone handset in his van near to Patsy's home around the time of her murder. And the detective said that he could have seen something that would help the investigation. So not that he was be a suspect as such, but he might have seen her. But as... As such, nothing, nobody came forward and and nothing happened with that information. By this point, police had only managed to trace nine out of the 22 people who were playing golf that day on the course next to where Patsy was found. The detectives also appealed for their help to trace a five foot 10 inch man who had dark grey in hair and who was wearing a dark suit. There's, again, not a lot said about him either. So, again, because we've done cases before where you have a um, a golf course involved where there's a lot of people that aren't always accounted for. I'll give you golf right. as such a bad name, but you know, it's um, people do go on golf courses that aren't playing golf. You know, those sort of areas are places where you do tend to find some not so great things happen, you know? Um, but mm-hmm. the, as they only, they only managed to trace a nine out of the 22 people playing. So they didn't even get all of the people that were playing golf that day that were scheduled in. So the police investigations at the time drew a complete blank and the murder wasn't, murderer wasn't apprehended. And basically it just went, all went quiet. Now it's been over, it's been over 40 years since Patsy was found. Both of her parents, like I said, had passed away, never found out what happened to their daughter. And the investigation into her murder found that there were no suspects that came to light no other witnesses than those we've already talked about um following her murder patsy's dad reported to police that he had received a call which was a death threat that the caller sounded to be like a young man possibly a teenage boy so the police put this down to some sort of hoax because unfortunately this happens doesn't it in cases there are people that that do that sort of stupid thing um, and nothing, nothing came of that one either. So they just, just said, oh, it was a hoax. I mean, I, I, would, yeah. I would assume or hope that they would at least investigate to confirm that it was in fact a hoax. But then it's 1980, isn't it? So they don't have the, like the telephone tracing equipment and that kind of thing that we have nowadays, mm. unfortunately. Yeah. So that was just put down to it being kids you know, being stupid and, and, and there wasn't any other calls, Mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't any other calls that were actually um, recorded. Now in 1996, the case reopened because the police had received um, information about a man from Hounslow. Now they arrested this guy and they raided this, this, this suspect's house at dawn on the 8th of July. It was a 33-year-old man, and that meant that at the time of her murder, he would have been 17. And that kind of like 14 to 17, that's interesting. Now, he was released on bail but was re-interviewed later that year in the August. Now, in October, he was released from police custody on bail, and it was reported that the police had applied for permission to charge the suspect from the Crown Prosecution Service. However, the CPS had decided not to prosecute the man. Oh. So there may be that it wasn't strong enough evidence, although they've got evidence, it might not have been strong enough, but it didn't, it didn't, you know, it didn't justify for the CPS uh, good enough evidence to, to charge him. Now, this man has never been named Hmm. publicly, so we don't know who this guy is because he's not actually been named. Okay. So he was 17. She was at the time. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so that's interesting. You know, we were talking about perhaps she was meeting somebody. That is quite interesting. Who she was supposed age. to be meeting. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Okay. Now, in 2007, Patsy's murder was considered to be linked to the serial killer Peter Tobin. Now, we know that he was okay. found to have killed three women between 1991 and 2006. We know. Peter Tobin's MO, we know how he used to work. We know that there was, you know, strangulation and, and sexual assaults yeah. with him. Now, police that worked on the time Tobin murders off. believe. Yeah, well, the time frame is off because obviously, but we do know that police believe that Peter to- Tobin has, has been responsible for a lot more murders than he's actually been connected to. Uh, like a lot okay. more murders. If you ever go to okay. David Swindle's... Um, show that he does um you'll realize just how many people they think he's responsible for hurting in Mm, one way or another because he does have victims that didn't die he does have victims that he has assaulted and raped and sexually assaulted that haven't come forward because they're too embarrassed was he was he ever active in this area well he's not far i mean peter peter tobin was throughout the whole of the country. So I think the police police okay. just looked at this because he went from like Scotland all the way down to like Margate, folks in that kind of area. Right. So you it, it would be he it would be kind of on the way down the country. It's it's possible that he was in London. Um London's very central to you know to everything. And he I think he did have I think he was living in London at some point, if I remember rightly. I think he was living in in London at some point. But it was reviewed as part of the investigation into un- other potential victims of Tobin, which was Operation Anagram. We know that. Um, and the, invest- the investigation was wound down, I think, in 2011. And they found no evidence that conclusively linked him to Patsy. So I think it was just okay. one of those things that they were just looking at it. And obviously, they have to consider that she might have been because of the, you know, because of the, the fact that he was active in that time. Now, okay. a new suspect okay. was arrested in Patsy Morris's case later in 2008. Now, this was nearly 28 years after she was strangled on Hounslow Heath. This was a 42-year-old man who walked into a police station in Norfolk and told officers that he had killed her back in 1980. So Detective Chief Inspector Howard Groves of the Barnes murder team said this individual claimed to be responsible of the murder of someone in 1980 on Hounslow Heath. So as a result of our inquiries, we came across the murder of Patricia Joyce Morris. He was therefore arrested for that murder, brought to a police station in London and then investigated. Now, he was released on bail and the charges were dropped because, according to local media, their reports say that he was believed to have mental health issues and he didn't actually Mm. have anything other than what was read in the paper. Okay. So I think quite conclusively we can discount him because he didn't know anything about the crime scene other than what was released in the press. Okay, I agree with that. Yep. So here we go again. In February 2008, police were alerted that serial killer Levi Belfield had confessed to a cellmate whilst on remand in prison that he had killed a young girl when he was just 12 years old. He had been convicted of two murders and attempted murder at the time he was on remand. The attacks had been committed between 2003 and 2004 in the vicinity of where Patsy was found. So we know that he was a prolific user of the Heath. Okay, He was said to have been obsessed with the murder when it was when it occurred and he remained fascinated by this unsolved killing. Now, friends of his have said he talked about this killing because it was revealed that he had attended Feltham Comprehensive School at the same time as Patsy and that they were known to each other. Now, some reports will say that he was her childhood boyfriend. However, Patsy's family told the press that they had not known that they'd even known each other. They, um, her sister Nicola said, we didn't know him. Um, it was a bit of a shock to us when we found out that they knew each other and friends of hers told us about it. This is horrendous. Obviously, that's what she's thinking. Now, in 2011, yeah. Belfield was convicted of the murder of another schoolgirl, Millie Dowler. Now, he had abducted and raped her in 2002. Belfield would have been 12 years old at the time of Patsy's murder, which occurred a year before he received his first conviction 
which was burglary aged 13. So his first his first police conviction, he was 13 years old when he was carrying out his first crime that he got caught for. So it's not yeah. necessarily the first crime he's ever committed, but this was the first crime that he got caught for. Okay, and he was 13 years old. Now, we also know that he repeatedly played truant from school and was mm-hmm. often known to frequent Hounslow Heath when he should have been at school. So we know that it's his stomping ground. We know that he had also committed murders, you know, on Hounslow Heath. We know we know that because he's been convicted of those and he's now in prison for those murders. So we know that he knows that area very well. Right. Former partners of Levi Belfield have said that he had a hatred of blonde women, women, sorry, and he targeted blonde women for his attacks, which we also know to be true. There has been speculation that Patsy's death was the beginning of Belfield's violent obsession with blonde women. Jesus. Okay. Wow. wow. So that's that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now yeah. I oh, the thing is with Levi Belfield, okay, is that he is one of those people that loves to be in the limelight. He is very egotistical. He's very arrogant. And we know already that he has also he's also admitted to other crimes. And we, we talked to Colin Sutton about it and he'll tell you. Levi Belfield has also said that he's done other crimes that other people have been arrested for. So right. he after it was revealed that Belfield was being investigated um, by police for George's daughter's murder, he said he was certain that it was a teenage boy who phoned him that time and gave him the death threat. Mm -hmm. And he said it was a local man because it was a local accent. Levi Belfield is a local, local man. He had a local accent. It's terrifying to think that somebody of 12 or 13 could have done that. Now, Levi Belfield is a big man. If you've ever seen him, he's, I think he's like, I think he's like six foot odd. He's a big man. Right. He's a broad man. He's a very strong man. Now, I wonder, at the age of 12, I know some like 14 and 15 year olds that are almost six foot tall, that are big, that don't look like they're early teens, you know? So I wonder, yeah. what was he like as a teenager? Could this possibly be that he did know her? Could it possibly be that they they did know each other and that she was going to be walking across the heath when he came across her, which is his MO? We know that because we know he's been put in prison for that before. But yeah. I'm going to however you now like you do. Police later established oh, that at the oh, time no, of okay. the incident, Levi Belfield was actually at the rectory in Hampton and that he had not moved to Felton Comprehensive until after Patsy's death. So they believe this was another oh. case of Levi, of Levi Belfield trying to attack attention to himself and trying to take credit for mm-hmm. more crimes. But just because he was in a different school doesn't mean to say that he wasn't on the, on the heath at that time playing truant. Because he was he was still living in the area, right? Yeah, in still in the area. Yeah. West London. Yes. Just at a different okay, school. So it's possible. So I don't think that you can discount him a hundred percent from this just because he went to a different mm-hmm. school. We know he plays truant from school. We know he's not a, he's not a, he doesn't abide by laws and rules at school. So he knows the right. area. This area has become a huge it's a huge pull for him because of his his later you know, his, his later um, victims. And I 100% believe that there are more victims than what Levi, well, than what we know about, than the, than the girls we Didn't, know about. Am I wrong in thinking that Levi Belfield, he, I don't want to say hunted bus stops, but there were victims yes, that, that yes. were... Yeah, yeah school girls at bus stops, yeah. Okay, yeah, there's videos. So there's like, yeah, Emma. that's right. Yeah. In his white van. Okay. So, so again... It's funny that you've got bus stop and it's funny that you've got Levi Belfield in with this as well. I just think it's one of those things that probably I think would be good to relook at now with the fresh eyes now, you know, Mm -hmm. knowing what we know about him and knowing what we know about his MO. I think it'd be interesting to follow that up. Hmm. I mean, mean, it it doesn't hurt, right? No, that's right. If you prove wrong, then that's it, that's great. You've ruled another person out. But I just, just a nagging feeling. I think it would be good to look into that with fresh eyes now. Yeah, I mean, it's scary to think that someone twelve years of age 
would be capable of of doing that, but there are people, there are definitely people out there that are, right? And I think Levi Belfield is one of those people that could be capable of committing oh, yeah, murder 100%. at a young age. 100%. I mean, he's burgling places when he's 13. It's a year before he's 13, right. you know? So he's already got that criminal, like criminality in him. So is it beyond the realms of possibility that he could have tried it on with this girl? She said no, and he's lost his temper? Or she's kind of started something started between them and then she said no and he's just you know lost mm-hmm. it we know what kind of temper he's got we know how cruel he is we know how vicious he is from the crimes that he subsequently committed in later years so could this be that this was one of the first times that he's every every serial offender has to start somewhere you know, there has to Somewhere. be the yeah, first exactly. yeah. the first case. The first case might not necessarily be a murder, but you know how things mm-hmm. escalate up into that. Could it be that this, unfortunately, could she have been one of his first victims that... And why, why would he talk about a 12-year-old girl on Hounslow Heath dying? Why would he talk to mm-hmm. a, a cellmate about that? I mean, this is a 1980 murder. Why would he be bringing that up at the time he was in, in, incarcerated on, on remand, why would you bring up something from 1980 if you didn't know anything about it? You know, why why would you admit to that? I mean, how would you know about that? You're 12 years old. How would you know that there was a girl that was but murdered there that you, you know, We're talking about know. Levi Belfield, who's a completely different different person. He's different from us, right? This could yes. He could have yeah. seen something in the newspaper about it and became yeah. absolutely and then obsessed just, or saw something on the news yes. and was has yeah. been obsessed with it ever since. Like yeah. that might have been, it might not have been him, but that might have been the catalyst. Know, yeah, of course. Something, the yeah. catalyst, right? So he gets obsessed with it and he's like, oh, I wonder what that's like. And then, yes. you know, it, yeah, very it, true. It snowballs from there. Very true. I mean, friends of his from I've, school have said that he was a he was obsessed with that mm-hmm. murder. So you're very right. He could have read about that, and that could have been what sparked his. You know, that could be what sparked his interest in in blondes. It could be he could have known that girl because I mean, you're never going to forget yeah. if you go into school with somebody who was brutally murdered when you were at school. You're not going to forget that. As an adult, you're not going to forget that story, are you? No. Yeah. So, right. Right. Could it be mm-hmm. that he's, you know, he's he's heard about it and then he's just bragging that he was responsible, possibly? I did that too. Yeah, like look how, yeah, look how evil I am. Yeah, that, look how badass I know. am. My first murder was at like twelve years old, and and he is like yeah. that. He is a very arrogant, very obnoxious person. So that also wouldn't surprise me either. I mean, sadly. Mm-hmm. The Met Police had no further lines of investigation and so they're no longer actively investigating Patsy's death and haven't been for some time. And they have said that unless new information comes to light, which of course they will then reopen it, they they won't. Now, I looked into which serial killers were active because I wanted to see if there were any... I mean, obviously, we've got the Levi Belfield connection, which I thought was the strongest out of all the the ones that they actually... uh, uh, Yeah. I mean, they even... even, um, there even was a, a point where somebody tried to say that it could have been Dennis Nielsen, but we, we don't. We know that it doesn't fit Dennis Nielsen's mo at all, no. and he was just active at that time. You know, in London, it wasn't as if he was in the area. It wasn't as if she, you know, she's a teenage boy or something. We know that Dennis Nielsen, mm-hmm. it's not his mo, and I don't think he's got anything to do with this whatsoever. But I did look in to see if there was anybody that was active at this time that possibly had some kind of similarity to this. And the only one I could find was the murders of Eve Stratford and Lynn Whedon. Now, Eve Stratford was in March 1975 and Lynn Whedon was um, September 1975. Okay, so I think Eve was March 1975 and Lynn was September of 1975. They were two young women okay. murdered in separate areas, but they were sexually motivated. They were in London. Um, Eve Stratford was a bunny girl on a model and um, Lynn Whedon was a schoolgirl. And they she was killed on the other side of London. Now, Lynn Whedon's case was reopened in 2004 because new DNA techniques revealed that she and Eve had been murdered by the same person. Okay. Okay. This Eve Stratford's case was then reopened in 2007, but neither case has been solved. But they're very similar in MO to Patsy's strangulation 
deaths, but those are sexually assaulted, which made me think it's only five years before Patsy's murder, okay, that mm-hmm. this happened, that these two ladies were successfully murdered, okay? What if this was the murderer testing out their their technique and they were disturbed before they could sexually assault her because she was on a heath? Could it be that this person right. attacked her, strangled her, was going to sexually assault her, but was disturbed because there's a golf course there, there's people playing golf. Could it be that that person was actually disturbed before he had the chance to do to her what he did to Lynn and, and Eve? Yeah, true. Possible. That's the only other deaths of similar, like a very similar like MO that I could place in the area within sort of like a, a you know a, a five five to ten year period it's the only two right. i could find that were very similar and if hopefully i've done my research well enough but that was the only two that i could find that were remotely similar i don't know i just um i just thinking about all of this i mean i think levi belfield is, is interesting yeah i do too um, I think the fact I think the fact that he he wasn't classmates with her that that yes. he can't, he, yeah. he went there out of that kind of you kind of have to take a step back from that a little bit like if it was like yeah, yeah they were they they were in the same school together they knew each other they hung out together they were girlfriend boy okay obviously if if that's the case yeah hundred percent yeah I think yeah. you need to take that very seriously yeah um, I agree. Something about this just, to me, seems like a, it was a stranger attack. So someone that she didn't know. Yeah. I keep, I keep thinking about the description at at the, the bus stop. Yeah. And I think you, you said that, that she was seen crouching. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so when I, when I picture crouching, I, I immediately think hiding. Like you're hiding from someone, right? Possibly, someone, yeah. There's someone that is following you. There's someone that you're you're afraid of that you are, you know, trying to make yourself small so they don't see you. Yeah. So is it that she crossed the heath? She came across someone who made her uneasy. She attempted yeah, to make maybe. herself small and yeah. hide at the station bus stop. Yeah. But they ended up finding her. That's what it kind of sounds like to me. I, I mean, I yeah. could be obviously completely wrong, but there's just something about that, which it just, I think, I think that eyewitness is, I think that's a, that's a very important piece to this. Of what so she I would like to speak, to, I'd like crouching. to speak to that witness. Cause I, and I'd like to see what the bus stop looked like because Back then, right. it could have been just literally like a lamppost with the bus stop sign on it. So it could have been like that. Or mm, it could true. have been one of those bus stops that have got a roof on it. So it, it depends on... It would be interesting to know what the bus stop looked like that that, that she was allegedly seen at. Mm-hmm. Um, and it would also... Because sometimes some bus stops back then didn't have like seats on them. Nowadays, quite a lot of them have like a rail that you can sit down and wait for the bus. So I'm wondering, was she crouching down because her legs were tired and because she was waiting for the bus and there's nowhere to sit so she's crouching down because she is waiting for a bus i mean she's 14 so an adult wouldn't do that but right. a child probably would so i'm wondering whether that was the case um for me i i just have this feeling looking at what we're looking at i've got a feeling she's left school with the ruse of i'm going to change my clothes and possibly is is then meeting someone whether it's like a love interest or just someone I think, and I yeah. think things have gone a bit, a bit strange from there. And either they've met on the heath, they said goodbye to each other, and on her way back, she's been attacked by somebody. Not necessarily the person she was meeting, but I've got a feeling that there's a reason she went on the heath. She knows she's not allowed to be there. She knows that. I've got a feeling that there's a reason she went to the heath. I don't think this person has like accosted her from the street and dragged her onto the heath because she's quite a ways no. in. So there's a reason she was on that heath for whatever reason. You know, yeah, and I don't I just, think someone's gonna. I don't think someone's going to take the chance of grabbing her and pulling no, her. No, I don't into think the so either. Off the street, no, I don't this think so. Would have happened. I think where it happened is probably where she was grabbed. 
Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think it, I think there was a reason she went onto the heath. There's got to be a reason she was up there. She knows she's not allowed to be there. Everybody knows young girls shouldn't be walking across the heath on their own. So I I think that she there's a reason that she was on that heath. Yeah. Whether that's meeting somebody or whether that's just trying to cross over to get to her dad quicker, whatever reason that is, something has happened mm-hmm. there. And and that's what's that's what's happened. But that's all we know. So and I would really like for this case to be talked about more. And I would really like the I would really like the connections between Levi Belfield severed or joined if we could do that because I mm-hmm. think that th- this girl has still got family that you know that she's still got siblings that wonder what happened to their sister and that's a horrible thing to have to deal with to not know where your sister is but also to know that she met such a gruesome and an awful end and I really think that they right. need people talking about this case to, to get fresh ideas fresh eyes on it because I think it's a solvable case no I, it's solv- solvable depending on what evidence has been kept yes how it's yeah. been capped yes and what can be tested yeah. i mean i think I this is one of those cases where it comes down to is there any testable dna yeah. available is there anything wouldn't that, that be amazing if there is the pantyhose yeah yeah wouldn't that be that's, amazing that's what one of these cases are it, yeah i think it, it it'd be very difficult to convict anyone with, without dna at this point oh i agree yeah i agree but even if the even if the family had a it's it's most likely that this has happened even though I understand you know you're not going to get a conviction unless somebody confesses and they can give you stuff that was at the crime scene that you nobody specific else knows specific information yeah yeah that's the only exactly. way that you're going to yeah and i think that it would be good for the family at least to have some kind of idea what happened to her because it's a horrible yeah. feeling to have to grieve for that person and and have that unanswered all this time but that's this week's case for you well thank you very much hopefully um people out there will start talking about it and yeah hopefully it can get solved sometime soon fingers crossed it's been long enough yeah definitely so at the end of every show as you know regulars listening in we like to lighten the mood a little bit and we like to do something that we call effective effective effectively no affectionately effectively. dumb criminal <laughs> <laughs> hey criminal Use a dummy. All right, Sherry. So this week we definitely have a dummy. Um, okay. There are people out there that I think take McDonald's Happy Meal toys a little too seriously. Okay. okay. This is one of those cases. So a, a man at a McDonald's in Nova Scotia was quite unhappy recently when he was given a donkey in his Happy Meal instead of a pack of Pokemon man cards as expecting. Oh, okay. okay. So he was not happy about getting donkey, especially <laughs> since this was the second time in a row that he got the donkey and not the Pokemon cards. Okay. So the man believed that the store had still had a whole rack of Pokemon cards that they were hiding. And he pointed to a display that was used for the promotion, demanding that he be given some of the cards or a refund for the Happy Meal. Okay? Oh, come on. After claiming that he had been given a donkey toy two times in a row, the man dressed like he was uh, hes ready for a hike. He threatened legal action against the fast food restaurant. <laughs> what? Now, obviously, he's... Uh, he doesn't sound like he's the bright, brightest bulb, so I don't know what legal action he would have to uh, to no. go off of. <laughs> no. So when they refused to give him Pokemon cards, he started yelling that he wanted to press charges on McDonald's. At that point, a manager insisted that the customer leave and that the that their location was simply out of the Pokemon cards. This Come man decided on. to start using fists. To show his unhappiness. And he began punching the manager what? in the face. Because oh, over once Pokemon again, cards. He did not get Pokemon cards. Oh, that's terrible. That's really bad. <laughs> so so while the so while this happened, a uh, another customer happened to to step up and he he uh, he basically went toe to toe with the other customer and they <laughs> they had a few rounds of uh, fisticuffs over, over Pokemon, Pokemon cards. cards. That's ridiculous. Yeah, so 
so this guy i wish i knew his name we don't unfortunately we don't have his name but yeah so um pokemon cards are not that important bro no they're really and not maybe, and why are you buying happy part- meals anyway you're an adult exactly and especially you think you're gonna get like a, a million dollar pokemon card from mcdonald's no, no man no it's not that big a deal so yeah going going to jail over a pack of pokemon cards <laughs> How sir, embarrassing. is not the smartest thing the what world, did you do so. armed robbery what did you do uh fighting mcdonald's over a pokemon card Maybe. pokemon <laughs> card <laughs> oh thank you very much thank i don't think that i don't think there has been a mcdonald's toy in a, in a happy meal that i've been like excited about no. since i was about eight years old no i don't I, to be honest i can't even remember what the most exciting mcdonald's happy meal toy is i've ever got to be honest i don't i can't remember none of them have been that special that i've been really that excited it's a bit crazy they need to do like adult understand. adult McDonald's ones where you get like little shots of like alcohol or something, <laughs> something a bit fun at least <laughs> when you're an adult, you know, yeah. or like an extra, yeah, 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 day off work or something. You can win, like we'll pay for you to have the day off work or something like that. They don't even worth fighting over, you know, but a Pokemon card, yeah. you, like you say, you're not going to get million dollar Pokemon cards in, in, an, in a happy no. meal. So why are you even trying? Like seriously, That's man. crazy. That's Pokemon crazy. cards. Pokemon. Cards. Thank you Come for on, that. Man. Oh, well, that's it for us for this week. We'll be back next week with another episode for you. It's the last episode of the year, and it'll be Morgan's episode, and we will then see you in the new year after that. So for now, be nice. And bye.